Okay, let's get started. <clears throat> Again, today's review. Um, there's no new material here. Actually, there's only one slide, which, well, two slides that should be different than anything else you've already seen before. The way I do reviews is to first allow me to go back and explain some stuff that I think I did a really bad job of explaining the first time around. So it's a feedback opportunity for me. And second, these are the things which I think are critical in terms of understanding the course. Doesn't mean they're necessarily going to be on the exam, which of course is Friday morning. Um, be here on time. If you think you're going to take longer with the exam than an hour, you shouldn't. 50 multiple choice questions. Please sit in the back. Uh, and that, what that means is when the next course comes in, they'll sit in the front and you guys can keep working. So there are questions about the exam at this point. It's not done yet, no. Okay, so um, yes, there are clicker questions. So we'll start out with those. Assuming this will actually start. <coughs> Cellular DNA replication is semi-conservative, conservative, semi-discontinuous, discontinuous, A and C. So everyone seems to agree that it's semi-conservative. I can also completely agree with you on that. Uh, second is semi-discontinuous. Semi-discontinuous means that we're making pieces on one strand and a whole one big thing on the other strand. So leading strand versus lagging strand. So it's both. Semi-discontinuous and semi-conservative. have to quickly select this. Um, are people not clear on why it's semi-discontinuous? So I'm hoping that would be obvious. <clears throat> Second question, in E. coli or EC contains binding sites for DNA A, binding sites for DNA bending proteins, areas of AT rich DNA, A and C, or A, B and C. So let's 
show the results. Uh, pretty much everyone seems to agree binding sites for DNA A. Yes, I completely agree with you on that. Um, areas of AT rich DNA, yes, definitely. You have to have both of those. Yes? It's up here. It counts down. Yeah, or it counts up actually to 130. Pardon? Okay, I can, I can tell you, but um, that's why I put it up there. Pardon? Okay. Pardon? Well, sometimes there, there's two sets of people with this. And so there's either people who vote immediately and those who wait till right at the end. And it doesn't seem to matter whether it's a minute or a minute and a half. So, but I'm more than happy to tell you when there's 10 seconds left. That is absolutely no problem. I'm happy to do that. And I'll do that on the next one, I promise. And yell at me if I don't. So, um, <laughs> But yeah, so binding sites for DNA A, areas of AT rich DNA. Um, both are correct. The question, of course, is whether there are binding sites for DNA bending proteins. Um, the answer there is also yes. There are binding sites for DNA bending proteins. And the point with this is really that it's about DNA structure as well as just the binding sites. So it's not just you're a linear piece of DNA, it has to have a specific structure to it. And we're going to see that when we talk about transcriptional regulation, when we talk about you know, everything else that's going on. It's not just one nice linear piece of DNA. Watson and Crick had a wonderful model, but that's not the way DNA is. Third clicker question, E. coli replication licensing occurs due to DNA methylation. DNA supercoiling, phosphorylation of DNA A, loading of the helicase, and DNA primase activity. Thirty seconds left. Is that enough? <laughs> Fifteen, fourteen, thirteen, twelve, eleven, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Zero. Um, I will try and make that bigger if I can. I don't know if there's a possibility to do that in iClicker, which reminds me, I've been trying to upload your grades. Unfortunately, there are a wonderful new version of D2L doesn't talk to iClicker very well. So I'm working on that. You will have them um, by the midterm, so by Friday. Um, even if I have to stay up all night trying to get them all to work. So um, yes, it's DNA methylation in terms of E. coli licensing. Uh, <coughs> Yes, one other quick thing here. Uh, phosphorylation is important for what kind of licensing? For eukaryotic licensing, phosphorylation is critical. So that was one of the things that I wanted to review here. This is the only new slide on this lecture. It's basically a review of the subjects that we've covered since the beginning of class, and I'll try and do this for each review. Um, great place to start if you're putting together your notes in terms of thinking about what to do. Many people have asked me, how do I come up with questions for the exam? Do I look at the book? Do I look at lectures, etc.? I just look at lectures, and basically what I do is I go through every single one of the lecture slides and make up one or more questions per slide, and then I decide which ones of those make sense. So. The exam could have been about 300 questions, and I've whittled that down to 50. So that's how I go about making my exam. Tree of life, um, 
critical thing on here is that we are over here in the animals, molecularly really quite different than all of these microbes, but fundamentally all really, really similar to each other. So a lot of the stuff we learn about studying E. coli, which is over here in the bacteria, relates very directly to animals, and that's because all of us have common ancestors back here. Um, I'm going to go through this stuff really quickly, so slow me down if you want me to spend more time on it. Information transfer, kind of interesting. We've actually gone kind of backwards as far as this course is concerned. Started out talking about proteins and chemistry, and have sort of worked our way backwards to transcription and DNA replication. But this whole idea of DNA going to RNA, going to proteins, and proteins having the activity which leads to the phenotypes is the fundamental tenet or the central dogma of molecular biology. These are the slides we had in lecture one, but they're nice reviews for the things that we've now gotten into more detail in a little bit later on. Um, DFK, DNA, of course, has molecular biology, polarity, that's five prime to three prime and three prime to five prime, symmetric in such a way that the pol polarity is opposite of the two different strands of your DNA. Of course, they're complementary in terms of base pairs. Gs always pair with T Cs, <laughs> Ts always pair with As. Um, and the way you make this is you have a template that gets polymerized, and you end up with this double strand. Of course, you pull it apart to do your replication in the next day, time around. One of the things that I didn't emphasize, but I probably should emphasize again, and also we'll talk much more about this, talk about DNA repair, is that DNA has this wonderful effect of being redundant. If you know the base pair on one strand, or the identity of the base, I should say, you know what the identity of the base is on the other strand. And so you've really got two copies of your information there, which is really important in terms of, again, repair and probably also for evolutionary aspects of things. Transcription, basically exactly the same information that you have in one of your strands, the template strand of DNA, which gets transferred into multiple copies of that piece of information. And the important thing here is, again, it's multiple copies of that information. So you get amplification of one particular segment of your DNA, not the whole thing. And, of course, it's not just an expendable information carrier. We know that RNA does a lot of other things above and beyond just carrying information. One of those, of course, is translation, which is really all about the RNA. You've just got this little amino acid up here at the end, which is what's being made. But it's really the messenger RNA, which is this orange band here, the tRNAs, which are these three colored pieces in the middle here, and the large and small subunit of the ribosome. What you can see really nicely here is that the P side of the ribosome is really covered. It's right in the middle of the ribosome. There's no way you're going to be getting tRNAs in and out of there. The A site, on the other hand, in this pinkish color, is much more open. That's where you're getting the new amino acid containing tRNAs coming in. And the exit site's really on the back side of the ribosome here, where you have that tRNA coming off. If you look at a cartoon, I think I didn't do a terribly good job of emphasizing this before. The actual event of amino acid polymerization, what the ribosome does, is hooking up the amino acid which is bound to the RNA in the P site to the amino acid which is bound to the RNA in the A site. And what that means is your growing polypeptide chain is always attached to a tRNA. And it's not a free piece there. It's just always being attached to the amino acid which is here. So basically, you're exchanging the bond that you have between the tRNA here and your peptide bond over here in the individual amino acid. So I think I didn't do a terribly good job of, of talking about that before. Polypeptides, again, 
true for pretty much all of the monomers we've talked about in this class. They've got polarity, a start, and an end, here N terminus to C terminus. The polymers of polypeptides, but also all of your nucleotides are the same way. They've got an N terminus and a C terminus. Also, people talk about this as the amino terminus and the carboxy terminus of your <coughs> polypeptide. As a reminder, most of the time in textbooks, you'll see DNA as being really big and proteins being really small. That's not the way it normally is. Proteins are usually much larger than your RNA molecules or DNA molecules. Insulin is an incredibly small protein. Much more normal is hemoglobin. Glutamine synthetase is big, but not ridiculously big. So if you think about it, there are way more proteins in terms of the mass than you have of your DNA, except that the DNA is just really, really long. <laughs> RNA, again, made from DNA through templated polymerization, and the only differences are really uracil and ribose. RNAs are wonderful at forming secondary structures. You say secondary structures now for nucleic acids, basically binding through base pair interactions and opposite strands. And to do that, they give these wonderful structures, which of course are going to give you functions. <coughs> we talked a little bit about genomes. We'll talk more about genomes a little bit later on. But important for this part of the course is that even though you've got in this case, six orders of magnitude and difference in terms of the size of your genome, going from some really small bacterial genomes to some really large plant and protist genomes. It really doesn't make a huge difference in terms of the numbers of genes that you have there, numbers of protein coding genes anyway. And the distribution of each of these sets of genes is pretty similar doesn't really matter what organism you're talking about. You're going to have 10 to 20 percent, which is important for metabolism and so on and so forth. One other thing here is we don't know about what half of those protein coding genes are doing. That being said, that humongous genome, in the case of humans, we care about humans in particular, but it's probably true for most of these other organisms as well. If you look at that 98.5% of your genome that's not encoding protein, at least not encoding unique protein, 80% of that is still probably not junk DNA. So this has been one of the, again, the big things to come out literally in the last couple of years. We've got the genome sequence, but what is it doing? It's doing a lot more than just encoding protein genes. So just wanted to mention that um, again in particular. Where do new genes come from? Um, I got an email this morning saying that this is a great way to make new genes, but there are probably other ways to make new genes too. And in fact, a lot of that junk DNA seems to be a source of new genes. But classically, the idea is that you have one gene that then gets duplicated, and then this second gene can now have a new activity because you have the backup of that previous gene. So a lot of gene families, in particular paralogs and orthologs, we'll talk about in the next slide, come from this gene duplication. And gene duplication clearly has happened a lot in the evolution of all the organisms, and of course, particularly animals and humans. Turns out that whole genome duplications have happened quite a lot as well in evolution. When I say paralogs and orthologs, what do I mean? Paralogs. So I'm pretty sure that I misspoke during the review session today. So I wanted to review and go back to this one particular slide here. Um, and this was mentioned, thank you, by the student in class. So when you think about orthologs versus paralogs, orthologs are going to be in different species and paralogs are going to be in the same species. So if we look over here at our ancestral cell where you have tubulin, you first have gene duplication and divergence. So this is a paralog here, alpha tubulin and beta tubulin are paralogs of each other. And that happened here 
in our first division, so right here. So now we've got paralogs, alpha tubulin, and beta tubulin in this ancestor back here. So alpha tubulin and beta tubulin are paralogs of each other. Now, once you're in these new species, which is what happens down here, now we can have orthologs, and all the orthologs of alpha tubulin are up here. So alpha tubulin in human is an ortholog of alpha tubulin in fly, which is an ortho ortholog of alpha tubulin in worms, which is an ortholog of alpha tubulin in yeast. Same thing is true with the beta tubulins down here. And the paralogs are going to be beta tubulin with beta tubulin in yeast now. Hopefully that now makes more sense. Uh, monomers to polymers, we already talked about this a little bit. Again, that amino acids, nucleotides all have a front end and a back end. They're all going to be the same. Pretty much all biological macromolecules are going to be made up of individual monomers. Why monomers? They're a lot easier to make, they're a lot easier to transport, etc. But also, <clears throat> they're easy to activate. And so when we say activation, this has to do with the chemical reactions that have to take place to go from monomers to polymers. And so the activation could be adding on a couple of phosphate groups to make an adenosine triphosphate. It could be the amino acylation, which happens in translation. Um, so these kinds of activated monomers are really critical in terms of being able to make polymers, because polymers energetically are really difficult to make. So you have to have these active monomers to be able to do that. In terms of amino acids, no, I don't expect you to memorize all of them. Just the few that we talked about in more detail. These are the acidic amino acids, the basic amino acids, particularly lysine and arginine, and aspartate and glutamate that are stably charged at neutral pH. Histidine bounces back and forth around neutral pH. And then proline in particular, because the side chain of proline is covalently linked at the backbone. And so this makes a big difference in terms of the structure, what kinds of structures you can make with proline versus any of the other amino acids. I don't expect you to draw bases or base pairs, but I do expect you to know these structures and where the individual atoms are um, in each of them and also how they're connected to the bases, et cetera. Where's your five prime and where are they base pairing, et cetera. We spent quite a while talking about interactions or chemical interactions, terms of binding, not binding, et cetera. Critical for molecular biology is the concept of the <coughs> binding coefficients or the dissociation coefficients. All that this is is two things coming together as a complex and each of them individually. The concentration of the individual ones divided by the complex is your KD. This depends on the rates of binding or unbinding. And most critically, what we use to talk about affinity of two different molecules for each other is the KD. It's the amount of free ligand that you have when half of your ligand is in its complex. So it gives you an idea. Millimolar KDs are weak interactions. Nanomolar KDs are really strong interactions. That's because nanomolar KD means you've got very little free ligand around. And millimolar KD means you've got quite a lot of that free ligand around. So it's not binding very tightly. A couple of people asked me, do we need to know equations on the exam? No, you don't need to know equations. But I would know the concepts that are behind these equations. Um, delta G being the free energy of any given reaction, which is related to the free energy at a standard state. And that free energy at the standard state, you can get from the equilibrium constant, just by knowing the equilibrium of a particular reaction. And of course, delta Gs for spontaneous reactions are negative. For reactions you have to put energy into are going to be positive. 
Particularly important, again, are these polymerization reactions in biology where you have to be inputting energy to get them to go. And again, these are all derived from nucleoside triphosphates, nucleoside triphosphates, nucleoside triphosphates. Any polymerization that you think of inside the cell is due to hydrolysis of these nucleoside triphosphates. Protein structures, switching gear a little bit here. Primary structure is just the sequence of the individual amino acids. How those guys come together is your secondary structure. This is interactions between backbone atoms, not between the side chains. Between side chains are what you get to get domains. This is our tertiary structure. One of these stably folded pieces can be a domain. Some proteins just have one domain. Some proteins, like this example here, have multiple domains. And then if you have two separate polypeptides that are coming together, that's going to be your quaternary structure. In terms of these polypeptides, again, secondary structures are what's happening due to your backbone here. Tertiary interactions are happening due to side chains, which are coming off. Yes? So a motif is some pieces of secondary structure which come together and have a particular function, but usually they're not stable by themselves. So also people talk about motifs as super secondary structure, so multiple secondary structures coming together. The other questions on protein structure. How do you get to these protein structures? Folding. Most folding is going to be due to hydrophobic interactions between all the hydrophobic side chains, putting them together, usually in the middle of your protein. If they don't come together properly, you have a misfolded protein, which is often going to lead to neurodegenerative diseases, as we know. Um, how do you make sure that happens properly? You have the chaperones, and these chaperones basically stop incorrect interactions, and usually these are those hydrophobic interactions that are not interacting with the things that they're supposed to be in order to give you the proper structure. If for some reason this process doesn't work and get you to the correctly folded protein, cells, particularly through the proteasome, have a very good way of getting rid of these misfolded proteins. Proteins, talked about lots of different ones. Beginning, we mostly talked about enzymes. These are those proteins which catalyze chemical reactions, bring down the activation energy barrier to getting a reaction to actually take place, brings the rates to a reasonable amount, but doesn't change your equilibrium constant, doesn't change the overall energy or delta G of your reaction. So it just changes the rates. Active sites of enzymes are usually very small parts of the enzyme, and often, but not always, they'll have binding sites and catalytic sites that are somewhat separate from each other. If you look at enzyme-catalyzed reactions, and again, don't expect you to memorize the equations here. There's a question on it. I will give you the equation on the exam. But the important thing to look at here is that the rate of a reaction, and that's this V here, the velocity of your reaction, is dependent on the catalytic rate constant, which is actually doing the chemistry here, and the concentration of your substrates and the affinity of the enzyme for those substrates has nothing to do with product concentration. So just in knowing the amount that you start with, how well your enzyme binds to those, and the catalytic rate, you can get exactly how fast your reaction is going. And you can you know, look at these it, um, calculations, et cetera. Um, the Km is also going to be half of your maximum rate that you can get in these reactions. Why do probably most enzymes in the cell be present, why are they mostly present in multi-enzyme complexes? They're mostly present in multi-enzyme complexes because 
as soon as you release some of those products from that first enzymatic reaction, usually that needs to be used in a secondary enzymatic reaction or a tertiary enzymatic reaction, et cetera. So basically passing the products of one enzymatic reaction to the next enzyme where it now will use that as a substrate for the next product, et cetera. And there are lots and lots of cycles. We'll talk much more about cycles in both cell biology and biochemistry. How do you regulate how these enzymes get turned on or turned off? Very often that regulation is through allosteric mechanisms, and all that allosteric mechanisms mean is that you have binding of a ligand to some part of your protein which is not the active site. And binding to somewhere where it's not the active site causes a change in the structure of that active site. That could be a change in the structure of the active site in order to activate it, or it could be a change to suppress or inhibit the activity of that particular protein. Changes in structure, we're going to see happening all the time. Probably the classic example, or one of the two big classic examples of changes of structure are these so-called G proteins. These are the GTPases. This is RAS, again, mutated in about 50% of solid tumors. Binds to GTP, has one structure. As soon as you have hydrolysis of this final, the gamma phosphate, then there's a change in the structure of this protein. The switch helix moves in, and you have different interactions, different structures. We saw this really in an extreme fashion in translation. You have GTP hydrolysis that causes a change in the structure of the protein. And once you have that change in the structure of the protein, particularly in translation, that leads to a change in the structure of the ribosome or the RNA that it's actually associated with. If as I mentioned before, you have problems with your protein because it hasn't properly folded, or you're using this for signaling purposes. One of the major covalent modifications, GTPase is not a covalent modification, uh, that happens to proteins is ubiquitination. And uh, again, I think I misspoke in class about this before. It's the <coughs> C terminus of ubiquitin that associates with the amino group on lysines. That's where you get the isopeptide bond formation. And so it's not in the backbone. But all of these basic uh, amino acids have amino, acid, amino side chains. And so those can hook up to carboxy termini. This can happen through ubiquitin binding to its target protein but also ubiquitin binding to ubiquitin. And it's particularly those chains of ubiquitin that form on a particular protein, which is the you know, time to degrade this particular protein signal. How do you study protein? Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so when the ubi so we, we ubiquitin chains are forming, so the carboxy terminus of ubiquitin will bind to a lysine side chain on that ubiquitin. So that's, so it's always going to be a lysine side chain, but it's always going to attach to the carboxy terminal end of ubiquitin. And if you look at the structures, you often you'll see like lollipops for ubiquitin. Um, that the stem of the lollipop, which is always what's attaching, that's the C terminal. Okay. One of the ways that people actually found out about ubiquitin was using exactly these techniques we're going to be talking about for the next couple of minutes. Centrifugation being one of those. Sort of two different kinds of centrifugation, either separating based on how quickly things sediment, a differential centrifugation, or looking at some other kind of property, and particularly density. And yes, our ultracentrifuges are working now. Uh, so this particular is a way of separating things based on density. Um, this differential centrifugation is almost always going to be the first step that you use in any kind of protein purification. It's just to separate the junk from what you're looking for. And usually, it's these smaller proteins that you're interested in, which are going to be soluble. They're going to be in the supernatant. 
Once you've done your centrifugation, usually the next step is doing column chromatography. We've got lots of different, call them flavors. All depends on the matrix. What's in your column? You can have, <coughs> in this case, it's just separation based on size. Here, relative to a very specific ligand protein interaction. In this case, it's an antibody column, but it could be some other interaction. And it turns out most people these days, when they're doing protein purifications, have a tag that they add to their protein, which helps in this purification and use it for affinity purification. Also use ion exchange chromatography. It depends on the surface charge of your protein. But basically, anything you can think about in terms of what's on the outside of your protein, you can use that to separate through column chromatography. Once you've separated them, you usually want to identify them. And the standard way to identify proteins these days is through mass spectrometry and usually through a ion trap mass spectrometer. The reason to use ion trap mass spectrometers is because you can do tandem mass spectrometry. When I say tandem mass spectrometry, it means that you select one particular mass and then you break that down into smaller masses. And that's what happens here in what people also call MSMS. Usually this will also be attached to a column that you start out with. One mass, you have one particular mass, you select on that mass, again in your ion trap, and then break it down into smaller and smaller pieces. You can do that in the mass spectrometer, and then you just scan through all of the masses that you happen to have in one fraction from your column. You've done that, you go back, you do it again. Takes a while, but fortunately most of these machines are automated. Come back in the morning and you have way more data than you know what to do with. Now we'll move away from proteins. Oh, sorry, yeah. So the question really is what, what do people consider proteomics? And how would I define proteomics? How would proteomics be defined on, say, something that happens on Friday? Uh, so basically, those first steps are really protein separation. So centrifugation is a protein separation. Column chromatography is a protein separation. So I wouldn't think of that as proteomics. When people talk about proteomes, they're talking about all of the proteins in one particular cell, one particular sample. And so you talk about analyzing all of them. So I would say in this case, proteomics would be, back up a slide, uh, is, would be analyzing all of the fractions from your liquid chromatography. So every single one of those. So you're looking at multiple different proteins. Whereas if you're going to be doing enzyme assays, for instance, you'll do centrifugation, you'll do affinity chromatography, and you'll just analyze that one protein. You wouldn't call that proteomics. So the proteome is going to be all of the proteins that are present in one cell, one tissue, et cetera. So you're looking at all of those. OK, moving away from our proteins into our nucleotides. Again, hopefully this is not new for anybody. Uh, otherwise, you probably shouldn't be in this class. Uh, the double helix structure, this again is the model brought forth by Watson and Crick from data which they got from Rosalind Franklin. How they got it is another question. Um, but a couple of things that are really important here. Probably the most is just from their model building, they got that there was a major groove and a minor groove, which were two very different size pieces in your DNA. So if you look at the major groove, that's this thing here, which just literally is wrapping around. So here's the major groove. It's going to go around the back. Here's going to be the beginning of your major groove over here. On the other side of the DNA is the minor groove, which is here, going around on the other side. And the important thing about the major groove, and you can actually see that here, is the top, the way that this image is drawn over here on this side in B, that's your major groove. That's where most of the chemical information is between your base pairs. The minor groove has much less chemical information in it. So you can read the sequence of your DNA by just looking at what's in the major groove here. The second thing, and this is again just the 
brilliance of the model building, Watson and Crick, and probably why they got the Nobel Prize, is that these two strands are opposite each other, again, opposite polarity. Which I mentioned right at the beginning, but it was not at all obvious at the time. But to make their model work, they had to put the two strands in opposite orientation. Of course, it explains a whole bunch of things like replication, so on and so forth. But that was really, I think, you know, most people say oh, it was the base pairing, which was a really big deal. Um, I think probably the opposite polarity of the strands is at least important, at least as important, I should say, as the, as the base pairs themselves. There seemed to be a little bit of confusion about denaturation in one of the clicker questions. Um, I had a question that somebody asked me on email about this is, you know, what does denaturation depend on? Um, it has a slight dependence on the length of your DNA. And so maybe that click question wasn't the best clicker question. I'm going to normalize at the end, so hopefully those will disappear. Um, but the main thing here is that once you start to denature your DNA, pull those two strands apart, this is a very rapid change that happens. First couple of bases come apart, the whole thing unzips really very rapidly. So this transition from double-stranded DNA to single-stranded DNA happens very quickly, and you do have a very defined point halfway through it, which is your melting temperature. And that's at the higher salt concentrations. That's <coughs> an increase, um, and again, depending on your GC concentration. Supercoiling. Everyone seems to be confused by supercoiling. Obviously, I don't do a good job of explaining this. So there was a nice uh, link to an animation. Um, thanks for posting that uh, that's on D2L, so you can take a look at this. Uh, but the important thing about supercoiling is that this molecule here in the middle, I don't think anybody would argue, is supercoiled. This molecule over here is just as supercoiled. And that's because twist versus writhe is interchangeable. Supercoiling, by definition, is a change in your linking number from the linking number you have in a relaxed DNA. So relaxed DNA, one of the strands is cut, so it can rotate around as much as you like. But just the structure, B-form DNA, 10 and a half base pairs per turn. Usually I'll use 10 for this class, it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, so <clears throat> if you've got a situation where you don't have 10 base pairs per turn, so in this case you've got those base pairs that have come apart, this is a supercoiled molecule. These guys interchange with each other because this untwisting can be changed over for writhing or crossing the two strands over each other. But you know, they're completely interchangeable. This molecule over here is just as supercoiled as this molecule is over here. Clear, totally unclear question in the back? Yeah. Yes. Twist is interchangeable with writhe, correct. Twist is those two strands in the double stranded DNA crossing each other, and writhe is the double strands crossing each other. And I know I'm not going to expect you to be able to notice that this is negative writhe versus positive writhe here. Don't worry about that. Yeah. No, the linking number doesn't change, but it's not the relaxed linking number. The relaxed linking number in this case would be um, a linking number of 36. Yeah, but you can think of it that way. So you pull it apart, it's, it's making strain, and the way that you bring those, the, the twist comes back together, but in that way you're getting those strands wrapping around each other. You can think about it that way. But again, it's the change from the linking number that you have in relaxed DNA, so twist of 10 basis pairs per turn. Any change, more or less, is then going to be your supercoil, positive or negative. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, well, so if it's, if it's a change now from, because what you've done is you've untwisted. You know, pulling those things apart is untwisting. That twist is coming back together when you're getting the rise that happens. 
Because if you look over here in the one in the middle, all those are base paired now, right? So you've got your twist back. Okay, <coughs> moving on, RNA structure, um, basically any RNA structure you can imagine, as long as the two backbone strands are opposite to each other, is something that could happen and very often does. And one of my favorites is this pseudo knot structure, which you have here, all base pairing interactions, all between opposite strands relative to each other. You make RNA through the activity of RNA polymerase. Here, RNA polymerization happens just like with DNA polymerization, except you have RNAs down here, got that extra 2 prime OH, but it's still attaching to 3 prime OHs. That 3 prime OH binds to the alpha phosphate in your triphosphates. You lose the pyrophosphate, which is here, the beta and gamma phosphates together. Then there's a pyrophosphatase, which cleaves these two apart, and basically that makes this polymerization reaction an irreversible reaction, because you're not going to get those two phosphates to come together and then those two phosphates to bind to your monophosphate, which is already there. If you look at transcription, one strand is going to be your template strand. In this case, it's our lower strand. As always, anti-parallel to each other. We're going to be polymerizing from 5 prime to 3 prime. That means your template strand has to be 3 prime to 5 prime relative to what you're making here. RNA polymerases are infinitely superior to DNA polymerases because they can start by themselves. So they always <coughs> um, can start somewhere. DNA polymerases are wimpy. They have to have OHs to extend from. Since they can start pretty much anywhere, you have to tell them where to start, and that's the promoter sequence, which is where your RNA polymerase binds, and then the coding sequence, which is what gives you your amino acid sequence for your protein, which is then downstream of the transcription start site. And that downstream is just saying, well, that's the, where you're making your RNA. Um, and this, of course, is true not just for RNAs, which are going to encode proteins, also true for all the tRNAs, the ribosomal RNAs, and the functional RNAs um, that you'll find doing a lot more functions than, than we ever thought possible. One of those we actually did know about, of course, is the ribosome, mostly RNA. This ribosomal large subunit is mostly RNA. The small subunit is mostly RNA. The tRNAs are all RNA. And it's only this reaction, which I just you know, talked about before when we talked about translation before. It's the amino group on the tRNA, which is present in the A site, which attacks the carboxy group of your extended chain, or extending chain, I should say, that's bound to the tRNA in the P site, which is going to extend this. These guys will be covalently linked to each other still linked to this tRNA, then you get translocation. This tRNA that was in the A site is in the P site. The one in the P site that now doesn't have an amino acid attached to it is now going to be left through the E site. The genetic code, again, I don't expect you to remember all the genetic code. A couple of things to note are your start codon, just one codon which encodes methionine. You can start <coughs> your messenger RNA, I should say start your protein, with a CUG codon or a GUG codon. And that's just because the initiator tRNA, which is different than the elongation methionyl tRNA, can actually bind to some extent to those sequences, CUG and GUG, as long as they're in the right context and have those other nucleotides which are right around them. So either being next to the Sharon Delgarno sequence in bacterial messenger RNAs or the consensus sequence for eukaryotic messenger RNA start. The other thing that I wanted to emphasize here is that the genetic code is degenerate. 
and by saying degenerate, you can also think about it. We talked a little bit about redundancy when we talked about this in class. But one of the ideas here is that evolution has selected for a degenerate code so that if you have mutations in your nucleic acids, it doesn't automatically change the protein sequence. And so you can have modifications in your amino acid sequence that don't change the protein sequence. Or if they do, very often they're going to give you an amino acid side chain which is really similar to the one that was otherwise similar to it. So let's start here. Let's look in this quadrant right here. So UUU is phenylalanine. That was, of course, the first one that was found. But UUA here is leucine. Leucine is an amino acid with a large hydrophobic side chain like phenylalanine. And so if you look at how all of the individual amino acids in the different classes fit into the genetic code, you'll find they're all really quite close to each other in many different cases. So glutamine and arginine are very close to each other, together with histidine. If you look at lysine, it's <coughs> here um, close to arginine. So few individual nucleotide changes are either going to give you the same amino acid or a very similar one. So probably through evolution, it's selected for these particular cases. And if you're more interested in the genetic code, take Dr. Niles Lehman's class in chemistry because he talks a lot about this stuff. Or just go and talk to him. He'll spend hours talking to you about the genetic code and how it was evolved. Uh, amino acid tRNA synthetases, these are how you get your individual amino acids into the ribosome so that they can be attached. But one of the things that I think I didn't emphasize enough was that the energy that you get for the polymerization reaction, so adding these individual amino acids together to get polypeptide chains, this comes from the activation of the monomer by the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. This is where you get the ATP hydrolysis that you need for translation. It's all the amino acyl tRNA synthetases. So this is an activated amino acid that's bound to your amino acyl tRNA that, once it comes down to the A site, can have that catalytic reaction making peptide bonds in the P site. So this is where that energy comes from. All of the other nucleotide triphosphate hydrolysis is GTP hydrolysis, either getting stuff to the right place in the ribosome or making sure that you have the right base pair interactions. Talked a little bit about tRNAs. Again, lots of people in the chemistry department work on these tRNA structures. Important <coughs> here is that we have multiple modifications that happen in your tRNA, and probably the most important of those is the inosine residue, which is very often at the first position in the anticodon, which is going to be binding to the third position in your codon. That's your wobble base, where you can have multiple different base pairing interactions that take place. Hopefully I haven't been beating this horse over the head too much. Um, the ribosome is a ribozyme. It's an enzyme made of RNA almost exclusively. If you think about the whole ribosome cycle, how you make a protein, it's really all about getting your initiator tRNA to the start codon. That happens in different ways in bacteria and in eukaryotes. But once you have the initiator tRNA bound to the start codon, that's going to be your P site, which usually is buried inside the ribosome structure. You get the large subunit of the ribosome that associates with that. And then we have elongation that takes place until you get to your stop codon. This interaction between the small subunit, the initiator tRNA, happens through base pairing interactions in bacteria. In eukaryotes, it's a more complicated situation. Here you have the initiation factors 
the EIF 4F complex that comes together, binds to the cap, also binds to the poly A tail of your messenger RNA. This whole complex interacts with the small subunit of the ribosome that already has the initiator tRNA that's associated with it. This complex then binds to the initiator proteins at the cap, translocates along the messenger RNA until it gets to the AUG, start codon, that start codon interaction with your initiator tRNA leads to GTP hydrolysis by your initiation factor two. That changes the structure, allows the large subunit to jump on, and then you have translational elongation that takes place. Translational elongation, okay, hopefully I've gone over this enough now, it's all about bond formation that happens here between the peptides that are bound to the tRNA in the P site and in the A site. Translocation, turns out it's first the large subunit that moves and then the small subunit that moves, and then once you've had this movement, you basically are back over to this position here, goes along again and again and again. Termination, again, we just said that, okay, what's happening is you're having a peptide bond form between your activated tRNA with its amino acyl tRNA, uh, amino acylation, that's the activated amino acid at the end of your tRNA, in the A site, which then gets transferred to the P site. Well, what do you do in termination? You can't attach it to anything else anymore. So here you have the release factors, which will bind to the A site and basically trick the ribosome into making a peptide bond to a non-existent amino acid, which is right here. And that gives you your carboxy terminus of the peptide, which you have uh, made. Once you've released this peptide, it's all well and good, but you still have this whole ribosome complex glommed onto your messenger RNA with all of the extra tRNAs which are in there. And so that's why you need two different sets of release factors in terms of translation. The first one is to release this polypeptide chain. The second one is to break open the ribosome so it can start again. Yeah, so the question is, does the, is the, I'll, I'll paraphrase it a little bit, but the molecular mimicry that has a tRNA, because these things look like tRNAs, does it actually have a bound water molecule or something like that at the end? No. This, this is on an aqueous solution. So it's just, it's just bound there. And so there's not a particular um, water molecule that's bound in that particular space. There's not a uh, bond exchange, which you have normally, which you'd have with the P site and the A site tRNA. Finally, talk about replication, measles and stall experiment. Again, this has to do with our new DNA versus old DNA, and that replication is semi-conservative. Everybody seemed to get that in the um, clicker question this morning. Um, you're always going to have a old strand here in red together with a new strand, double strands, they pull apart, replicate, and then <clears throat> come back together, and you can see this nicely if you look just through this part of their data, start out with heavy DNA, get intermediate DNA. You always have this intermediate DNA, but you get more and more of your light, completely light DNA as you move down through this. At the bottom, the bottom two lanes here are controls. They're mixing experiments where they started out with a piece that they got from right at the beginning of their experiment and the stuff they had from the middle of their experiment right here. Basically just to show that you had these different bands. And then here is after four generations that you've got heavy, which is what you started with, that's your zero fraction, and your four generations, which is what you have here. What does this job? It's a whole group of DNA polymerases. DNA polymerases have to have nucleotide 
triphosphates, they have to have templates, and the big difference between your DNA polymerases and your RNA polymerases is that all the DNA polymerases have to have three prime OHs. So you have to have an RNA polymerase to make a primer whenever you're doing replication. That primer has to get onto the DNA to make its RNA. How does that happen? Through the origins of replication. Here, again, it's DNA A binding, which is here. There's extra structural proteins, which will give you more of a very specific structure here, a T-rich region. And then the really critical aspect is getting the helicase around this strand of DNA to really pull these two guys apart. Once you've started that helicase going, you can get replication to take place because the primates will come down, make an RNA primer, et cetera. But that's the really critical step is getting this helicase bound. It's true in bacteria. It's true in eukaryotes. Really doesn't make any difference. You have this loader complex because putting a circle around a DNA is not easy. That's our helicase loader, which interacts with DNA A. Once you've got the helicase loader again, you can go. Once you've started, what does this look like? This is now shifted over to the eukaryotic nomenclature with the unfortunate exception of the T antigen here. Um, this should be the MCM proteins if you're really talking about a eukaryotic replication fork. The leading strand and lagging strand polymerases are both here, both going in a 3 prime to 5 prime direction. Of course, it's a problem. You've got the lagging strand. How do you deal with that? You pull off this extra piece and basically trombone model, and I put that link again in D2L. You can take a look at some of the animations looking at this. Uh, the helicase here separates those two strands. You have single-stranded binding proteins, RPA, and then multiple primers that you have to form on your lagging strand. Leading strand has one primer that starts at the origin. But the lagging strand, you have to have multiple primers. To get rid of these guys, you either have RNAs H's, or in the case of eukaryotes, also the flap endonuclease right here, which will chew off these RNA pieces, because you don't want to have those RNA pieces left in your DNA. A, you don't want RNA there, and B, they're actually relatively low fidelity in terms of the replication that takes place there. Only thing we haven't talked about today, anyway, is <coughs> licensing for replication in eukaryotic origins. There are, of course, multiple origins of replication in eukaryotes because most of their genomes are bigger. Their DNA polymerases are considerably slower. So you really have to have multiple origins of replication. And most of the time they have a cell cycle. So they only replicate part of the time in their cell cycle. So it's really important that these origins of replication get turned on once and only once each time they go through the synthesis or replication phase. So the first thing that happens is you have binding of the origin recognition complex, which is a functional replacement for DNA A. The sequences are actually very different relative to each other. And then these licensing factors, which basically say, hey, you know, this is the right place to be, and it's a place to replicate. These guys only are going to associate with the origin recognition complex when it's not phosphorylated. And the reason it's not phosphorylated is at the beginning of S phase, the phosphates on those origin recognition complexes are cut off. They associate, they load the MCM helicase. Once the helicase is on, it pulls apart two strands, primase goes, et cetera. So that's that key step. Once you've had this happen, now the kinases will phosphorylate these, particularly CDC6, of these licensing factors and the origin recognition complex. And what this says is, hey, we just started to replicate here. Don't start here again until you're all the way through S phase and basically all the way through the cell cycle until you're ready for the exam on Friday. 